welcome to Read Aloud with Miss Cottle. Today we are reading the inspiring book, Drawing on Walls, the story of Keith Haring. Enjoy. Drawing on Walls, a story of Keith Haring by Matthew Burgess, pictures by Josh Cochran. Published by Enchanted Lion Books. Here is Keith Haring painting a mural with hundreds of children in Toma City, Japan. Keith draws the outlines and the kids fill them in with their own designs. When Keith was a kid, he and his dad often drew together. They took turns making lines and watched as a balloon became an ice cream cone or a dog transformed into a fire breathing dragon. Sometimes they even drew with their eyes closed. Keith drew all the time everywhere, but not on the walls, his mother would call, just as he was getting some big ideas. Keith was the oldest in his family, and gradually as he grew, three sisters arrived. First Kay, then Karen, and finally, when Keith was 12, Kristen was born. They live in Cutstown, a small town in Pennsylvania. Keith loved being a big brother. In the summer, he organized games and carnival contests in the backyard, and he would invite the entire neighborhood. He also formed clubs with secret passwords and made little houses where friends would play. When Kristen was old enough to hold a crayon, Keith invented a game like one his dad had taught him. Each would draw on a sheet of paper and when someone shouted stop, they'd swap sheets and continue drawing. Keith also painted Kristen's hands and pressed them on paper to make prints. Look, a mobile. Keith's best friend, Kermit, loved making things too. At school, they were known as the artists. Eager to have a studio all their own, they cleared some space in Kermit's aunt's garage. Keith loved drawing anything with a twisting, turning line. That traveled through and around, up and down, in and out again. When Keith was 16, he began to feel restless in Cutstown. That summer, he caught a bus to Ocean City, New Jersey, where he lived a block from the beach with kids from Pittsburgh and New York City. Keith washed dishes to pay his way, and in his free time, he drew. Sometimes he would stay up all night and watch the sunrise. After high school, Keith moved to Pittsburgh to study commercial art, but it wasn't a good fit. He wanted to be spontaneous and free following his line to see where it would lead. On a trip home for Christmas, Keith stumbled upon The Art Spirit by Robert Henri. After a few sentences, he felt as if the book was speaking directly to him like a friend. Do whatever you do intensely. The artist leaves the crowd and goes pioneering. So Keith left school, took several jobs and saved enough money to hitchhike across the country. He was searching for his next big step and he took the art spirit with him. The music, dance, and visual arts, the forms of expression, the arts of hope, this is where I think I fit in. When Keith returned to Pittsburgh, he spent hours in the library reading about artists he admired. He 
he also saw an exhibition of enormous paintings by Pierre Alakinsky. Keith was blown away. Inspired, Keith now knew what he had to do to find the intensity and freedom that he desired. NYC. Keith arrived in New York City and enrolled at the School of Visual Arts. He was 20 years old. One day he found rolls of paper that someone had tossed into the gutter. He unrolled them at this, in the studio at school and began making bigger and bigger paintings. Keith especially liked painting on the floor by the open door where the sunlight poured in. People passing on the street would stop to watch or talk with him about what he was making. Keith loved it. He didn't believe that some people understand art while others don't, or that art should be hidden away in galleries, museums, and private collections. Keith wanted to communicate with as many people as possible. The public has a right to art. Art is for everybody. The East Village was Keith's new neighborhood. With his friends, he formed Club 57, a local hangout in the basement of a church on St. Mark's Place. A few years later, when Keith was 23, he fell in love with a DJ named Juan Dubos. Keith listened to Juan's music while he drew and Juan cooked big meals in their tiny kitchen. Together, they were happy. Keith wasn't earning money from his paintings yet. So he worked as a bicycle messenger, a sandwich maker on 7th Avenue, a bartender at the Mud Club, and an art assistant in a Soho gallery. He even got a job picking wildflowers in New Jersey. But his favorite job ever was drawing with children at a daycare center in Brooklyn. There is nothing that makes me happier than making a child smile. With his artist friend, Fab Five Freddy, Keith walked through Alphabet City admiring all the graffiti. He loved the colors, the size, the fluid lines, and the blossoming of art on the streets where people could see and enjoy it. One night while strolling down King Street in the West Village, Keith heard the thump and beat of music and discovered Paradise Garage. He was mesmerized by the dancers spinning on their heads and doing the electric boogie as disco and hip hop rocked the room. For Keith, drawing and painting were like dancing. He called it mind to hand flow. One day in the subway, Keith noticed blank panels where advertisements used to be. Suddenly, he zipped up to the street, bought a box of white chalk, dashed back downstairs, and began drawing on the walls. People paused as they rushed from here to there. For Keith, this was what art was all about the moment when people see it and respond. Maybe it makes them smile. Maybe it makes them think. Maybe it inspires them to draw or dance or write or sing. When Keith was 24, he was offered a major one-man show at the Tony Shafrasi Gallery in Soho. The opening was packed with artists, musicians, celebrities, and friends, and Keith's family came all the way from Cutstown to celebrate. 
Keith's life as an artist was taking off. But no matter how busy he became or where in the world he went, he always made time for children. Keith understood kids and they understood him. There was an unspoken bond between them. And since children often asked him to draw on their t-shirts, skateboards, and jeans, he always kept a black marker handy. The kid from Cutstown who had longed to draw on the walls was now receiving invitations to paint murals all over the world. He was invited to West Germany to paint a stretch of the Berlin Wall, which had been built to divide people, even family and friends, and keep them apart. Keith believed in the unity of all human beings, so he painted a long chain of interconnected figures. He also painted a wall with 500 high school students in Chicago, Illinois. It was his longest mural ever at 488 feet, and it took five days to complete. To honor him, then Mayor Daly declared it Keith Herring Week. After watching Keith work, a kid came up to him and said, I can tell by the way you paint that you really love life. And Keith did love life every single day, no matter what difficulties came his way. Even when he learned that he had a serious illness called AIDS, Keith didn't stop making art and sharing his gifts with the world. He was overwhelmed by sadness at first, but then he decided that he would live each day fully as if it were his last. I appreciate everything that has happened especially the gift of life I was given that has created a silent bond between me and children. Children can sense this thing in me. One morning while listening to musicians on a New York City street, Keith was recognized in the crowd by a father and son from Italy. Keith invited them to his studio in return, they invited him to paint a mural and have an exhibition. In June, 1989, Keith arrived in Pisa to paint a wall on the church of San Antonio. The friars who lived there welcomed him to dinner inside their monastery. As word spread, people came from all over Europe to meet Keith and watch him work. A massive crowd waited for Keith to make his final mark. When he did, everyone burst into wild cheering and applause. The city threw a huge party with music and dancing in the streets. Kids, grandparents, soldiers, friars, everyone celebrated Keith's masterpiece. Without question, he said, Pisa is one of the highlights of my entire career. From the time he was four years old, drawing with his dad at the kitchen table until the day he died at 31, Keith remained spontaneous and free, following his line wherever it would lead. And though his life ended too soon, Keith's line is still with us. And it goes on forever. At the end of this book, which I encourage you to purchase for yourself so you can read it at home, is a wonderful biographical note about, about Keith Haring and also an author's note. I'm not going to read them both to you now because I want to encourage you to buy the book yourself, but I do want you to see this photograph of Keith Haring and the children watching him work. Whatever else I am, I'm sure I at least have been a good companion to a lot of children and maybe have touched their lives in a way that will be passed on through time. 
Keith Haring. That was Drawing on Walls. I have a question for you. How do you feel free and spontaneous? At which moments do you just want to follow your own instincts and do things and be spontaneous and in the moment? Keith Haring provided an amazing example for us of how to follow your spirit and be true to yourself. If there's something that makes you feel really joyful, you want to share that with the world, the world needs it. So be free, be you, be bold, be like Keith. Take care of each other.